29 and 30. And we're going to pick up here. Remember chapter 28, he had blessings at the beginning and then a whole lot of curses at the end. That is the idea, if you keep my commandments, I'm going to bless you. Here's the way you'll be blessed. And if you do not keep my commandments, then you're going to be cursed and here's all the ways you'll be cursed. And essentially, those are two polar opposites that he presented to them. Here, he looks at the fact that God had delivered them and cared for Israel at the first part of this, and then we'll go on down as he continues to urge them to be faithful and true to God when they get into that land. So let's begin here, Deuteronomy 29, let's read verses 1 through 9. Who will grab that for us? Philip. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides, besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, You have seen all the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. The great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders. Yet yeah, the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. And I have laid, I have led you forty years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. You have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or similar drink, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And when you came to this place, Sahan king of Heshbon and Og king of Bashan came out against us to battle, and we conquered them. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and to, and to have the tribe of Manasseh. Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. Okay. So, first little section there, he talks about how the Israelites had seen, but they had not seen. Um, so, it seems on the surface a contradiction, but when you think about what he's referring to, it makes sense here. It says they saw the miracles in Egypt. So physically they saw those things, but then he says, you know, the Lord has not, verse 4, given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see, ears to hear. So how did they see but they didn't see? How did they hear but didn't hear? Any thoughts? Zach? Well, the chapter ends with a hint about the secret things belonging to the Lord. So I wonder if that has to do with part of this. There were things they didn't know, they didn't yet need to know, that they weren't able to perceive. But it's probably more to do with their own dullness and their own blindness, not necessarily the Lord's prevention of them knowing His whole plan. So it might be a little bit of both, but probably more the latter. Gotcha. Hank, do you have something? Nancy? Well, to me, it was um, partly dull of hearing and not really seeing. But part of it was they really did not understand the whole plan. They could not see at all. So they could see the miracles. They could see that Jehovah was the powerful, was their God and powerful. But the end of all of it, they really couldn't see. What, where it was all going, what it was all really establishing about. Right. They, they had this concept of the physical side of things, but those spiritual things is where they were slow to catch on. Now this generation here was a faithful generation because this is Joshua's generation really that he's talking to is going to go into the land. But he says, look, you, you've seen all these things, but you really haven't fully grasped it yet. And that's part of why... In Deuteronomy, he's preaching through these things and saying, you've got to stay faithful. You have to stay faithful. This is very important. If you're going to be in that land, you're going to be blessed. You've got to be faithful to the Lord. So they had a bit of blindness of heart, but then also just that inability to see beyond and to see what was ahead of them and what the Lord had in store for them as a people and as a nation. Um, in verses 5 and 6, he talks about, you know, 40 years they're in that wilderness and what happened or maybe what didn't happen. Clothes didn't wear out. The shoes didn't wear out. Yeah, clothes didn't wear out. Shoes didn't wear out. Um, the Lord sustained them 
through that entire time. So, how many of you have shoes that you were wearing 40 years ago? I wouldn't be surprised if there was someone because the longer I live, I'm like, well, I've had that like 20 years, you know. But, but we haven't been walking through a desert in those conditions, things like that. But he's, what he's saying is the Lord sustained you through this time. Philip, did you have something? What what did they have in the desert? Water and manna. Yeah, water and manna. Exactly right. And when he says bread and wine, he's he's simply pointing out the fact you did not live a settled life of people who farm, who cultivate, things like that. Because the bread, to produce bread, you have to have fields, you have to have wheat. You have to have grain of some kind. You have to process that grain and all of that. And for the wine, you have to have the vineyards and things to grow and to harvest and then to make that. So he's saying you, you didn't have that, but you made it through. God was with you. God took care of you. Um, any other thoughts there? John. Well, going back to that, their eyes didn't see. That was a warning that Moses gave. Isaiah gave the same warning, but so did Christ, saying that you got to be able to see the Lord's work through His work. And they, they just couldn't, they couldn't see, see past the physical and see the spiritual workings that God has done in their life, that God did in their lives. And we're the same way sometimes. Yeah, there are bigger things going on here than what we just see right there in front of our face. Exactly. And. We need to um, have an open heart as we prayed a little while ago to, to perceive these, to understand God's will in our life that we may serve Him honorably. He says in verses 7 and 8 that you know, they were given military victories. So God was with you. You saw all those miracles that delivered you out of Egypt. God sustained you through the wilderness. And He's given you these victories on the east side of Jordan. And that land was divided up among some of the people there. And so in verse 9, he says, Therefore, here's the conclusion. Keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. God has proved himself to you. If you will but stay faithful to him, he does not change. He will not change. He'll continue to be with you through it all. All right, let's jump now to verses 10 to 15. Who will read Deuteronomy 29, 10 to 15? Charles? All of you stand today before the Lord your God, your leaders, and your tribe, and your elders, and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little one and your wife, also the stranger who is in your camp, from the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water. And you may enter into the covenant with the Lord your God, and into his oath, which the Lord your God makes with you today that he may establish you today as a people for himself, and that he may be God to you, just as he has spoken to you, and just as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I make this covenant and this oath, not with you alone, but with him who stands here with us today, before the Lord our God, as well as with him who is not here with us today. Okay, so question one I'd ask, who was subject to the covenant? Who is he says comes under the falls under it? I guess it would be all that stood before him that day. Before him that day. Okay, so that would be the entire generation that's alive there. Something else, Lynn? I'm saying everybody. Okay, everybody. The current generation as well as all the future generations. Current generation and future generations, Sean? But interestingly enough, there's some foreigners there, evidently. There's some sojourners there that they hear and they believe it and they, they participate in this. Okay. So remember back in Exodus, it said that it was 600,000 of the Israelite men that came out, but they also came out with a mixed multitude. There were other people in Egypt who at the time of the Exodus, evidently they said, 
It's our time to go too. We're going to jump in here with them and head on out because they were under the, the servitude of the Egyptians just like the Israelites were. And evidently some of these people have just been with them the entire time. So there are these strangers, these non-Israelites who are there, but he's saying, look, if you're going to live in this nation, then you are subject to the laws that govern this nation. Makes sense, right? If you live here, then you have to abide by the laws of this nation. And so they had to accept Judaism if they're going to live among the people because they were to drive out and to get rid of all the pagan idolatries. You, you can't have that among you. So they need to accept it. But it's that generation and the following generations that were to do it. And he lists out, you know, you've got the men, the women, the children, all the people <clears throat> who are there with him that day. And it's pointing out this is a perpetual covenant. This isn't just something for this generation and then the next one figures out what they want to do. It's something that goes on and on and it's not going to change from one generation to the next. So if there's different people in this land, a new generation, doesn't mean the covenant no longer applies. It's going to apply. And then no matter how much time passes by, this covenant is still going to apply. Anybody want to make an application for us? Roughly what year was this? Roughly. Hey, 15th century, which would be 1450, give or take 50 or so years. But that's, that's when we're talking about 1450 B.C. thereabouts. Now, in David's time, when did David live? Roughly. All right. We're, we're at some point in the future, somebody help remind me, we'll, we'll do a biblical timeline study so we can plug these, these highlights in. About 1,000 B.C., right? So 400 plus years later, that law was still in effect. When was the exile? When did the captivity take place? Babylonian. I'll, let's just narrow it to that. The Babylonian captivity. Return. Yeah. Sit around 606. There was 606, 596, and 586 or 87, somewhere in there. Those three waves of Babylonian captivity, they came back 536, 2616, uh, uh, if, if my numbers are working right. But anyways, so, so you, you jump forward to another 400 years, same law in effect. When Nehemiah was around and they were teaching, that was in the 400s B.C. So a couple of hundred years later, the same law still in effect. So it's just that idea, it's always going to be in effect for the children of Israel. Of course, we know until it comes to its fulfillment, its completion with Christ and the New Covenant. So how long is the New Covenant in effect? Until the Lord comes, till the consummation of that covenant, till it's reached its end point in Him returning. Exactly right. doesn't matter how much time passes. Doesn't matter what generation there is, the people may be different as time goes by, and they will be. It's still going to be the same covenant in effect. It's not going to change. Just a great principle in there. All right. Anything else before we jump a little further? All right. Let's go 16. We. No, let's skip 16, 17. It's a little bit of a parenthetical there. Let's read 18. Just 18 and 19 right now. Who will grab that for us? Deuteronomy 29, 18, 19. John. Beware lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve other gods of those nations. Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit to then he hears the word of his sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be saved if I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. This will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry life. 
Okay. Um, verse 18, again a warning, don't fall into idolatry. So I asked you to describe the problem in verse 19, which I, I had a little bit of a challenge following John because my translation's a bit different. So John may, and those that have that same translation may have a little different answer, but verse 19, What's the problem? Well, it's kind of twofold for me. There's rebellion in the heart. Okay. And it's self-delusion. Lying to yourself. Self-delusion, lying to yourself. How is a person lying to themselves in this verse? Because they are denying that what is clearly going to happen to them will happen to them. Okay. Anybody else? What's that? He's patting himself on the back. Yeah, patting himself on the back, Jesse. Kind of a personification of ignorance is bliss. Okay. Yeah, he's he's looking at himself, not following God's law. He says, I'm good. I'm following his law. John? This is someone who is stubborn and thinks he's okay staying in his stubbornness. That is not all right with God. Right. He's got to get out of it. In the New King James, at the latter part there, it says, as though the drunkard could be included with the sober. So he's saying this, this man who's, who's living in sin, he's stubborn <clears throat> in his heart, but he, he says of himself, I'm good. That's like a drunk person saying, I'm sober. And I don't know if you've seen those videos online where you know the cops pull someone over, it's a dash cam video, the person is just staggering around drunk, but they swear up and down they're sober. Like everybody can see that. You're you're lying to yourself. You're delusional, right? But really, you're defiant. You refuse to obey in your arrogance. So a defiant and arrogant heart is stubborn and will not be forgiven by God. Even though you think you are, you're not. Right. Does anybody see another principle he's laying out here in verse 19? Let me ask you this. What's he been addressing before this? What? Who, who does he address? Verse 10. Hey, your leaders, your tribes, your elders, your officers, all the men of Israel. How might we sum that up? The nation. He's addressing that broader nation. He says, you as a nation have to be faithful to the Lord. Verse 19, what's he saying? As an individual. Individually, you have to be faithful. It's not like, well, the, the nation overall is faithful and here's this guy, defiant, stubborn, living in sin. It's not like he's going to get a pass because the nation is faithful overall. No, he's he's still accountable. So it isn't just a national commitment to the Lord, it's an individual commitment to the Lord. Alright, any other thoughts there through 19? Mike? I was just thinking also about where he says, I have peace. And maybe just a warm sense of what peace is. And we see that today also. We're given one definition of peace, but it's not the biblical definition. Yeah, some people will lie to themselves to ease their own conscience, or they've been told a lie, they've accepted that to ease their own conscience, versus actually looking into the Word and seeing what it really teaches about that peace, that peace of mind. All right, let's read verses 20 to 23, please. Who will grab that? Deuteronomy 29, 20 through 23. The Lord would not spare him, for the, then the anger of the Lord and the jealousy would burn against that man, and every curse that is written in the book would settle on him. And the Lord would blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord would separate him from all the tribes of Israel for adversity, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law. 
so that the coming generation of your children who rise up after you and the foreigner who comes from a far land would say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness which the Lord has laid on it, the whole land is brimstone, salt, and burning. It is not so, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there. Like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adama, and Zeboiim, which the Lord overthrew with overthrew in his anger and his wrath. Okay. So punishment would come on both man and nation for unfaithfulness. Um, the one of the things he points out is that this unfaithfulness is going to impact the whole nation. If if people begin to turn from God, there's going to be a problem in the land. Uh, where's an example of that? Especially when they first invade the land. Very early on. Ai? Okay, what happened at Ai? Well, they were supposed to destroy everything. And one guy he took some spoils and then he buried it. And everybody's, you know, all of a sudden, Moses realized, I mean, Joshua realizes that something's not right here. You know, we got problems. And uh, they finally get him. And he admits what he did. And they killed him and his family. And, you know, I mean, it was a mess. And all because he didn't do what he was told. And, and he acted everybody else. Exactly. That story of Achan, and he took the the Babylonian garment, the, the silver, when they went into Jericho, and then the next city they tried to attack, the Israelites, some of them end up being killed, they're driven off, and they just, they can't figure out what is going on here. Well, come to find out there's sin in the camp. And they had to address that and remove it before they could progress and keep going. So that's that kind of principle being laid out here. This is a warning being given about that. Um, and he says, you know, others are going to see the destruction that I will bring against this land. And they're going to be amazed by it. It really begins there, verse 22, and really goes on down to 28 or so there. But it says, you know, they're going to go and they're going to see this. And they're going to realize, oh, it's because they didn't keep covenant with God. They weren't faithful to Him. This destruction, how terrible it's turned out to be. But I want us to jump to verse 29. Who will read Deuteronomy 29, 29? Paul. The secret things belong to the Lord, our God. But these things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the work of this law. Okay. So I asked, how can we apply this? What's this talking about? What's the practical application of it? Secret things belong to God. But those things which are revealed belong to us, to our children. Well, to me, it's like there are some things that, that God has even said, even if He told us, we wouldn't understand it. Mm -hmm. you know, so there are some things that we won't know. He doesn't reveal to us, and that—that's His. We, we're not held to that. But the things that belong to us, which is His Word, His law, that is what we are accountable for. That's what we have to follow, and. Because of that, you know, we have to stay faithful to it. And, you know, that will be one of the curses of all that. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, anybody else? I think one of the things that stands out to me is, you know, he's saying, you know, if I haven't told you everything, I'm not going to tell you everything. But the main thing is that he has told us enough. Okay. Hey. And that's all I know. He's told us what we need to know, right? He has told us what we need to know. And that's the part we need to focus on, we need to take in, we need to meditate on, and apply in our lives and live by. And be satisfied with that. Yeah. Zach? There's a, 
uh, encouragement here because the way that it's phrased is but the things revealed belong to us. Not that they don't belong to God and they're from Him, but all things are for God and through Him or whatever how that verse goes with that. We have to cherish what we do have because God's given it to us as a possession. And we have it in physical print or on our phones or devices, things that we can carry all the time. So there's a real tangible application. Okay, yeah. And part of that principle is we're stewards of what has been revealed. And he says here that we may do all the words of this law. He's, he's phrasing that as this is a benefit. He's given it. It's for your good that you may do it. And so do it. Mike? Yeah, you know, I was going to say that it kind of brings it to mind the uh, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2, where it says that, um, you know, that we've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. Mm -hmm. So if it pertains to life and godliness, you're going to find it in here. And, you know, it goes on to say that's for the true knowledge of, um, of him who called us. Um, but to me, that's just a, a great comfort to know that I don't, if I want to know about uh, life and godliness, I'm not going to look any further than what's in my life right now. To try to find anywhere outside of that is going to lead to something else. Not life, not godliness. Right. Rob. See, I was just going to say, I think also in body that this is a warning as we understand also in Colossians 2 and verse 18. And there he says, Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, mainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Yes, exactly. Colossians 2, 18, the warning about those false teachers that would come along and boast about or try to make claim to things they have not seen. They don't have that insight. Um, one of the principles here is silence doesn't permit. Silence just doesn't permit. We have to have positive divine authority for the things that we do. Um, there, there was one other thing. Oh, a uh, great example of this, and it, and it may be you know, tangential a little bit, but if you go and, and research various commentaries, especially older commentaries, you'll see people where it talks about in John 8 and Jesus stooped down and write on the ground. They'll tell you what he wrote on the ground. <laughs> Nobody knows what he wrote on No one has any clue whatsoever what he wrote on the ground. That's not been revealed. It's not for us to worry about, not for us to speculate about, it's whatever. It wasn't revealed. It just says he wrote on the ground. And it's those kinds of things so many men have gotten in trouble, including brethren, have gotten in trouble trying to explain what's not been revealed. We got to leave those things alone. Stick to what has been revealed. That's clear. That's understandable. We we can latch on to that and follow it, as he says here. Do all the words of this law and be blessed by God for having done what He has given to us. Any other thoughts? So we can take away the fact that those secret things have absolutely no impact on our obedience or our salvation. The only thing that does have an impact is what has been revealed to us. That's the only thing we need to work on. Right. Those secret things need to be left alone. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So chapter 30. Let's read here. Let's read 1 through 10, but it's, it's, these are kind of long verses, so let's break it up 1 through 5, then 6 through 10. Who will grab 1 through 5? Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 5, Ron. Now it should come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you. <laughs> And you return to the Lord your God and obey His voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts 
under heaven from where the Lord your God will gather you, and from there He will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And 6 through 10. Mike. For the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. So love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. The Lord your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecute you. And you shall again obey the Lord and observe all His commandments which I command you today. And the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hand, in the offspring of your body, and in the offspring of your cattle, and in the produce of your ground. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, just as He rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the Lord your God to keep His commandments and His statutes, which are written in this book of the law, if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Okay, so I asked you in question four to summarize a promise contained in these verses and what similar promise is given to us. So what's he talking about here? He's talking about the return of captivity. Okay, you, you depart from me and I'm going to scatter you to the wind, but what? If you love me and keep my commandments, I'll bless you back. I'll bless you, I'll bring you back. And I'll, in fact, he says, I'll prosper you more than your fathers. When you return to me, I'm going to bless you and bless you abundantly. What's a similar promise to us? For one, Todd, in Luke 15, for example, the prodigal son who hit on bottom and was restored and blessed abundantly, which teaches us that repentance is is always an option for us not to take away from our studying Hebrews on Sunday about those who have right. fallen away who don't want or really don't want to repent but think they can be forgiven so not that exception to mm -hmm. repentance. But if we seek restoration, he will forgive it. Right. Great example in the prodigal son, how he was fully restored. John Jefferson? Well I I didn't I didn't want to interrupt your thought. Go ahead. Well in Jerusalem in Acts 3, Peter preaches this exact, exact thing, referencing what the prophet spoke about. I think he's talking about just starting with Moses, repent that your sins might be blotted out in the times where refreshing will come to you and the Lord will recognize. That's kind of a paraphrase. That's what he preached to those, those Jews in Jerusalem referring to this. Repent. Yeah, right. Repent. You can be restored. Yes, and, and they were guilty of killing the Son of God. And so they could be restored. In 1 John, remember 1 John chapter 1, and beginning in verse 5, he makes this promise. He says, This is a message which we have heard from Him and declared to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, that's what we were reading before where the man was in sin. He's like, I'm okay. I have peace and everything. Well, that's like the the drunkard saying he's sober. No, no you, you can't live in sin and say that you have fellowship with God. You, it's, it's not the truth. Now, verse 7, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And he goes on to talk about the fact that Jesus is our advocate before the Father. But the point being, as a child of God, if we go into sin, God says there, there's a remedy for that. There, there's going to be consequences. You've broken fellowship. There's different consequences with sin. But if you'll come back to me, I will fully restore you. You will be forgiven by the blood of Christ. But you have to meet those conditions. You have to repent. You have to confess your sin. If you're not willing to do that, 
then you won't be forgiven. You won't be restored. But if you do, just like He said to the people of the Old Testament, if you return to Me with all your heart, with all your soul, Deuteronomy 30 verse 10, you do that, I'll bring you back. I'll restore you. That's how we have to be. Any other thoughts there? All right. Ron? Over in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, I'm going through those verses here. The thing that I believe is uh, parallel to this is that you know, God has called us to be a blessing to one another. And he goes on and says that this is because God has called us to inherit blessings. And then through this passage, you know, he is saying, you know, he that would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking to see. Let him turn away from the evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But, it, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So in the context that he's telling us to turn away, in other words, repent, make a change, and God will hear you. And you will become a recipient of the blessings that he has purposed for us. Yes, exactly right. It's, it's up to us to make that decision. In fact, in this next section, back in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 to 20, he puts that choice before them. And um, let's read here Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 20. Let's just go ahead and read all of that together. Who will grab that for us? Philip. For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments, His statutes, and His judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not you shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey His voice, and that you may cling to Him, for He is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to you. Okay. Now question five I had asked, where is God's command and why is this important there in verses 11 to 14? Okay, in our hearts? In our mouth? Anything else? What does it say at the beginning of that verse in 14? It is very near you. Right? God's command is near us. Um, we see how that applies to the Israelites. It certainly applies to us. Right? Where does this come up in the New Testament? You may have a little footnote there. Romans 10, he quotes this. And what's the point of him saying this? The commandment I give you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It's not in heaven. You know. Well, how's somebody going to get to heaven and, and find out what God wants? You don't have to do that. You don't have to go beyond the sea. Well, how, how are we going to get to the other side of the ocean? We don't have to say that. What's he telling us? In your heart. In your heart. How? How? 
Seeing what he's telling us is that the word is accessible to us. God is not each and every one of us that will seek after him. And God has never left us ignorant. From the very beginning, we have had the knowledge of God's will throughout all generations. And in Romans 10, as, as you mentioned there, uh, you know, that's what Paul was writing to them, that you know, the Word of God is accessible to us. If we have ears that hear, and eyes, you know, that see, and we seek to comprehend His will. Yes, exactly right. Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul is at Athens. He's preaching to pagans who are thoroughly steeped in idolatry. And he says to them in Acts 17, verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord and hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. Athens was so bad, so infested with idolatry, the ancient people said it's easier to find an idol than to find a man in Athens. And Paul tells them, God's not far from you. You'll just open your eyes, you'll just open your heart, you'll see it. You know, sometimes we get these people, when, when we tell them, look, here's what the gospel says, you have to believe, you have to repent, you have to confess, you have to be baptized to be saved, and everybody else is lost. They say, what about the guy down in Africa? Well, what about the guy in Africa? What does the Bible say? He's near. He's near him too. Why, why do we think we're so special and unique before God and the poor guy in the African jungle is not? That's a poor view of God. God wants all people to say, be saved. By the way, Acts chapter 8 is the answer to that. The Ethiopian. He was African, right? That's the answer to it. Also, first of all, that's just a deflection. It is. And it doesn't matter if it's the guy in Africa or if it's your next door neighbor. The fact is, we're talking about you. And what does this mean to you? What about those people? Right? Exactly. Just, just like relatives who have passed on before you. That's not what's at issue here. What's at issue is your soul and your relationship to the Lord. Exactly right. Very good. Zach? Just a matter that the Holy Spirit has a part of that for Christians. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3 3 says that we are the letter of Christ, cared for by us, referring there to apostles. Uh, yeah, we receive that truth and we carry that truth out into the world around us. And one of the things, <clears throat> excuse me, that he, he mentions there, you know, it's not too mysterious for you. It's not in heaven. It's not on the other side of the sea. <clears throat> excuse me. You know, Eastern religions have this concept of you have to go on some type of spiritual journey and you have to go to the far reaches of the world. You have to go to Tibet. You have to go to the top of the mountain to some guru who's going to tell you about the mystery of life. No, that is not what it is. God's Word is not like that. His way is not like that. We just simply open up the Word of God. We read it. It's not hard to understand. Are there some things hard? Yes. But what we need to know to have fellowship with God is clearly, plainly revealed. And we need to accept that. Now, just for the sake of time, because I heard the bell. Question six. What is the contrast and what makes the difference in 15 to 20? What's this contrast here? We have a choice to make. You have life and you have death. You have a, you, you choose one of those 
And if you notice here how Moses leaves this thought with them is a positive that God wants you to obey. He gives you the answer to the multiple choice test there. Yes. Yes, exactly right. Any other thoughts to add to that? Ron? Yeah, verse 19, he goes on and says, you know, in addition to that, you have blessings and cursing, which go parallel with what John's saying about life and death, and that, you know, both you and your descendants need to choose, you know, are you going to live or are you going to die? Just like for us, are we going to live spiritually or are we going to die uh, spiritually? Yes. Exactly right. Anybody you want to add to that? I, I think it contrasts uh, if you uh, dwell in His Word and do His commandments, you can live. But if you don't, the body still be alive, but you should be alive. Yeah, spiritually dead. Nancy, do you have something? All right. One of the things we want to recognize here, well, let me let me put this in question form. What's between life and death? As he's laying it out here, what's what's in between life and death? What's that third option? There isn't one. There is no third option. There is no other alternative. You will either choose life or death. And we choose that. God does not choose that for us. We choose it. He, he says, Moses is telling them here, he, I just, one of the things I do wish is it was like, okay, I want to hear Moses' passion in this. As he says to the people, latter part of 19, therefore choose life. You know, choose it. Make the right decision here. But within a generation or two, they're gone. Any other thoughts there? Go ahead. Ron, I was just going to say the other part of your question where you asked what makes the difference, well, that's verse 14, the word. Yes, the, the word that we do what with? We take it into our heart. Well, in the New Testament, it's revealed to us starting in Acts that Christ died for our sins. And that fact, it says in Acts, should circumcise our hearts. Romans 5 there tells you that's the Holy that's how the Holy Spirit speaks to you with that fact that should circumcise your heart is strung out through the entire New Testament. There's no excuse on what choice about not making the choice for life because that, that message is drilled into us and should and should cut our heart. And if it doesn't, then it goes back to what we talked about before where we're stubborn and we think we're okay in our stubbornness. Right. Right, exactly right. All right, thank you all very much, Lord willing. Deuteronomy 31 next week.